Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the annual peak at the upcoming legislative session offered by the excellent legislative committee of Grandmothers Against Gun Violence. And we are so happy to welcome all of you here today, including our special guests who will be introduced by Renee Hopkins in a moment after I have the honor of introducing Renee. But let me just say that we usually begin by welcoming any people who are here for her or his first time. So if that is the occasion, if you wanna give a wave uh, rather than stand up and we applaud you, we'll wave back at you. If not, if you're all familiar with grandmothers and about to renew your membership or already have, thank you. That is wonderful. So good, we will get going. First, uh, three small housekeeping things. By this point, we are all rather familiar with Zoom and with housekeeping things, but just to make it clear, please stay on mute. Uh, please you put any questions you have into the chat box and you are welcome to keep your video on or off your preference. Uh, as, as you wish to do. So I know I just said that Renee will introduce our three wonderful guests and we thank you for being present this morning. But I'd like to take just a moment to recognize in particular our retiring Senator David Frock. I am a member of the 46th district. I have been so grateful to have a person of Senator Frock's caliber and commitment represent us in this district. And we all know what a champion he has been for gun violence prevention and looking for common ground, common sense in and solving our tragic public health epidemic of gun violence in this country. David especially took the lead on extreme risk protection orders coming back to make sure that uh, we finally got ERPO. And um, while ERPO maybe hasn't become a household word yet, it will, it will oh, with time and with work. But Senator Frock, you have been a true gem. And I thank you, grandmothers thanks you. I happen to notice since I am a constituent in your departing letter to your constituents, you pledged to continue in your um, civic life, looking for solutions to climate change, to healthcare and to gun violence. And as always, we would love to work with you and support your efforts in any way we can. So just a hands up for Senator Frock from all the, all the grandmothers today, thank you. I now want to introduce Renee Hopkins, and this is an equal pleasure to introduce Renee, who is the CEO of the Alliance for Gun Responsibility, which is our highly respected, amazing, effective, productive organization in the state. And I have known Renee since she first came as an applicant for this position. I think it was six or seven years ago. But I would say Renee has put in about 20 years of work in these six or seven years, helping along with her boards and her extraordinary staff to build the Alliance into the most effective state-based gun violence prevention organization in the country. We know what good work it does here in our state, but it is also a model and an inspiration for other state organizations around the country. And Renee, it is such a pleasure to have you at the leadership role of this movement in this state. Your persistence, your competence, your graciousness, your collaboration are helping grow a movement that will ultimately succeed. So welcome and let me turn it over to you. And thank you for coming to be our moderator today and being such a friend to grandmothers. Oh, thank you, Margie. <clears throat> it's an absolute pleasure and honor to be here with all of you today, and it's so wonderful to see so many familiar faces, um, and hopefully we can all see each other in person again someday soon. Uh, definitely miss seeing all of you. 
Um, I, Margie asked me to start by just giving a brief overview of our agenda this year. I'm going to be really, really quick. Um, we have a couple of pieces that are coming back to us. High Capacity Magazine is going to be a top priority this year, and hopefully we can hear from our great legislators about um, the prospects of that moving. We will also be asking for $15 million in funding for community-based violence prevention programming through the Office of Firearms Safety and Violence Prevention. We're also going to be continuing to work on limiting opportunities for armed intimidation. We see how destructive that is um, in our communities. And the last thing that I'll mention um, in our long agenda, there's something that I'm really excited about and I anticipate grandmothers will be really excited about it as well. And that is um, passing a piece of legislation that would require and mandate public education around safe storage to be disseminated through every school district in our entire state. Um, as you can all imagine, that would be hugely monumental um, to move and we're really excited and hope to have you working with us um, to pass that. So um, I'm going to move on now because the people you really wanna hear from today are our great legislators. Um, and as you all know, each legislator with us today is an absolute champion of gun violence prevention legislation. And we have a really nice balance of experience with the people that are with us today. Senator Frocht, as we all know, has been a stalwart leader of our issues for a long time. Representatives Barry and Berg are just beginning their legislative careers, but have clearly demonstrated their commitment to legislation that reduces gun violence. A little bit more about each one of these wonderful people with us today. Senator Frocht has served in the Northeast Seattle's 46th district since 2010. Um, and as Margie already mentioned, he will not be running for re-election next year. Uh, having served in a number of leadership positions in the Senate, he is now the vice chair of the Ways and Means Committee and of the Health and Long-Term Care Committee. He's played absolutely key roles in expanding our state's extreme risk, extreme risk protection orders and in rewriting the state statute on the use of deadly force and increasing training for officers regarding the use of deadly force. Senator Frock, it's great to have you with us today. Also, Representative April Berg was elected last year to serve the 44th Legislative District in Snohomish County. She brings, <clears throat> she brings a wealth of experience uh, serving in local government as a small business owner, as a large business manager, and, a, and is critical to understanding gun violence issues. She's also a former Edmonds and current Everett School Board member. A focus of her energy has really been directed towards ensure, ensuring quality and safe public education. Representative Berg, it's great to have you with us today. And lastly, um, as way of introductions go, Representative Liz Berry. She began her legislative career last session as well <clears throat> after she was elected in the 36th District of Northwest Seattle. She was the legislative director for Congresswoman Gabby Giffords when that crazy, crazy, tragic shooting occurred, sorry. Mm. And her passion for reducing gun violence springs from that. She was then the executive director of the Washington State Association for Justice. And she's recently announced that she will sponsor 2022 legislation dealing with restricting access to untraceable firearms and to report lost or stolen guns. So welcome each of you. It's so wonderful to see you all and be with you today. I know you were all asked to um, prepare some opening remarks uh, in response to this question. So I will just repeat this for everyone's um, information and then pass it on to each of you. In recent years, Washington state has passed significant legislation to reduce gun violence. Despite these successes, gun violence continues to grow. In your view, on what issues should the gun violence prevention movement coordinate and concentrate in the coming session in order to maintain our momentum and make an impact on the epidemic of gun violence? And let's start off with um, Representative Berg. Thank you so much, Renee, and thank you for that great introduction. I'm so excited to be here with my colleagues about talking about this important issue. Um, Part of my background story um, comes from a place of activism at the student level, and, and this will kind of tell you where, where I'm going to go with that focus. Um, and part of my activism in the Northwest, going to, to Oregon State, 
um, at one point I was targeted by the Aryan nation. And so as a, as a young student, I had to wear Kevlar, had to have personal protection because my picture um, and a lot of information about me was found in a place with a lot of guns. Um, and, and apparently they didn't wanna do really nice stuff to me. And, um, and so the police intervened. I say that because fast forward almost 30 years and a lot of our students, a lot of our young people, a lot of our social justice activists are in a similar situation with a much larger scale. And we're seeing guns in places for intimidation and for fear. And I believe as in our state, we have made tremendous progress on common sense gun reform, but there is more to do. And we're seeing that in spaces that are impactful with folks trying to speak up for their rights and they're, and they're being intimidated for that. So as we look forward and move forward with gun um, common sense gun laws and legislation, that promotes that, I think we really need to look to public spaces. We need to look to areas where folks are being intimidated when they're trying to participate in democracy or, or have their voice heard. And so for me, um, specifically this session, I'm introducing a bill to have gun-free, weapons-free election zones. And so it's it's a common sense bill. It's a it's something so needed. Um, you know, again, fast forward to where I am as a legislator, I was, um, you know, subject to a recall or not a recall, a recount in my precinct. And um, and my husband went because I was injured at the time and couldn't physically be there. And it was the picture taken was of him standing in this right in front of this kind of chain link cage watching folks recount. And when he came home and told me about that situation and how intimidating it was, there was folks there kind of pushing and shoving and lots of remarks yelling. And we had heard of other places where because we don't have um, prohibits on open carry in that space, it can be very intimidating and our workers feel intimidated. Well, the county auditor reached out to me and said, look, that's just one of many instances where our workers are literally sitting ducks, um, just sitting there trying to, trying to do what's right for democracy, and they have the chance for intimidation. So, so the piece of legislation I'm inter introducing to specifically um, address that would be to make those zones weapons free when they're counting the ballots. That said, that's just one piece of democracy that's intimidated. So as we move forward with common sense gun laws, we have to focus on where these guns are being brought to intimidate people, intimidate students, activists, um, and just everyday folks. Um, and I think that's gonna be kind of that next level, that next conversation, that next potential, um, you know, if you will, kind of fight for uh, common sense gun laws. Thank you so much, Representative, and really appreciate your work in this area um, and understand how heartfelt it is for you. So thank you so much for that. Uh, Senator Frocht. Well, thank you. Uh, am I? Yes, uh, you can hear me. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. And, and thank you. Um, thank you for those very kind um, introductory uh, comments, uh, Margaret. I really appreciate that. And um, I um, I have enjoyed working with the Alliance and with the Grandmothers Against Gun Violence and the Grandfathers Against Gun Violence, who are part of the Grandmothers Against Gun Violence, uh, and so many people. It's really been inspiring. Um, I've got to know Representative Barry and her personal story, and we've talked about um, how important this issue is to us. And I, I don't know Representative Berg as well, but it's a pleasure to 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 uh, get to be with you in this in this conference. And I think your legislation that you're proposing is so spot on. I, I worked on a bill uh, last year uh, related to election harassment and, um, and uh, making some changes in that regard. And I think you are so spot on that the, um, our democratic process is essentially under threat and we can't have a democratic process where armed intimidation in any sense for election workers, no matter those at the ground level, just counting ballots, or those at the higher level is somehow acceptable. And so uh, I 100% support what you're proposing. And if I can help in any way in the Senate, please uh, let me know. And I look forward to working with you on some other measures as well. And then I would just say in response to the agenda, Renee, that you put forward, um, all of those make so much sense. If you look in particular, the safe storage education, if you look at what um, I looked actually looked again at, at uh, our initiative and as it as it went into the RCW after the Michigan shooting, they of course have no safe storage law in Michigan as I understand it. Uh, I'm not even sure they have a restriction, I could be wrong on this, on whether or not a minor can actually possess uh, a gun. So the parents uh, clearly, I don't know what was going on there other than uh, they had a gun 
uh, they were, you know, I just can't imagine how irresponsible they were. Uh, but there's no safe storage law in Michigan um, that the parents uh, violated. Uh, maybe they invited, violated some common law standard given the circumstances. Um, I think that is absolutely critical. Uh, we've seen over and over again where we've had youth go into schools um, where they have acquired or had access to the firearm from their uh, parents um, who have not locked it up. We saw an incident in Eastern Washington, as I recall, and others as well. Um, we did some great work with the initiative to, to codify that statute, and now it's time to make sure that we educate people and know what their rights and what their responsibilities are. I think that's, that's, uh, that's really, really important. Um, I would say that uh, in terms of kind of where we go from here, um, first of all, the, the, the situation, I, I fully support the notion of accountability that the Michigan prosecutor is, is putting forward. I think it's it's frankly high time, and the facts of that case are so egregious. I mean, we'll see what happens when when it goes to court. I mean, it's certainly not a legal slam dunk, but the idea of holding someone accountable on such egregious facts when they should have been responsible, um, had more responsibility towards their their child. I recognize that not every situation is the same, but that was an egregious situation, and I hope it does send a message around the country that if you if you are irresponsible, if you are negligent, you might not only be negligent civilly, you may do conduct that arises to a criminal standard of recklessness or um, um, advanced negligence, if you will, that would uh, would cause you to be liable uh, criminally. And I think it's uh, I think it's a very important case. I'm glad that she's bringing it. But the, the, the school shooting issue is one issue that we have to deal with. I think in terms of where the, the movement goes from here, and the day-to-day -day violence, I think we need to have more, you know, as legislators, it's easy for us to sort of pass a law and say, we ought to create, make this as the new standard, safe storage is the new standard. We're not gonna allow people under 18 to purchase a weapon or 21 or whatever, the, the rules that we did around long guns, et cetera. In the initiative, we can have extreme risk protection order statutes, which I am very supportive of, obviously. Where I think we, we maybe get a little bit lost is we're not as conversant in the community response that needs to happen at the grassroots level with communities that are being plagued around the country. We see it uh, in our own community and parts of the Tacoma Seattle region. So I think we need to maybe make, be more aligned with the community groups who are trying to uh, deal with those issues related both to gangs or just a culture of violence that comes at times out of uh, uh, lack of opportunity, out of uh, social dynamics, out of uh, 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 just called the cultural problem of gun of, of gun violence uh, that we have to deal with. So I think that's something that maybe the, the movement uh, could be more assertive in, and I think it helped lead policymakers in that direction. Because I would say, from my own standpoint, you know, it's not something I'm as comfortable with. It's easy for for me to sit up and say, "Hey, we need a law on this. We need an ERPO statute that creates a legal liability." But these softer things that are going to really get at the core problem of the dynamics between people in communities is really, really critical. So maybe that would be, uh, in my mind, uh, something that we we should focus on. So, um, uh, and to that end, I guess one thing that we've talked about, I've been exploring uh, with some colleagues from the alliance, is whether or not we can find a way to um, have Medicaid help to reimburse certain hospitals or health providers for gun violence related uh, services or, or gun or treatment that they have to provide to those victims. It's sort of on the margins of the problem, but it's something that could help in terms of financing those local uh, health institutions that we've supported. Uh, and so we're exploring that right now. So those are, those are some introductory remarks and I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Senator. Um, and I'm glad to hear about your prioritization of the community-based um, violence intervention work. I think that is really important and we'll definitely be fighting for that this, um, this coming session. And now um, let's hear from Representative Barry. Hi everyone, it's so good to see so many friends on this call and I saw our own First Lady Trudy Inslee was here too, a grandmother against gun violence. So it's it's really fun to see you all. Um, I come to this movement as somebody who has a really personal story with gun violence in their life. I, as Renee mentioned, I served as 
legislative director to former Congresswoman Ari um, Gabby Giffords from Arizona. I was her longest serving DT staffer and um, just had just left her office just literally days before the tragic shooting in Tucson that killed six people, including my friend Gabe Zimmerman. So here's, I don't know if you can see, oh no, you can't see. Um, Gabe and I started on the first day, I'm gonna see if I can turn off my virtual background so that you can see Gabe. Um, this is me and Gabe at the US Capitol building. Um, we started at the first day in Gabby's office together in 2007, and we also shared the same birthday. So I think about him um, every year on our birthday together. And it was a really tragic day that really illuminated the fact that um, this was a movement that I had to be a part of. And it really inspired me to run for office when there was the opportunity in my community to contribute to this movement. So it's really an honor to be with you all here today and to share my story. Um, the question that Renee posed is what, um, what action do we think next year will have the biggest impact on gun violence? I actually think funding the Office of Firearm Safety and Violence Prevention at 15 million or above is what we really need to do. We saw in 2020, um, homicides by guns um, increased almost 50% in Washington state. So much was interrupted due to COVID. Our, you know, our community's playgrounds were closed. Our schools were closed. Our community centers and our pools were closed. There was a real disruption in our society and for people and communities to go that are positive places and for them to gather and feel safe. And because of that, you know, we've seen that in other states and other cities around the country, these um, these, office, these offices that have been put together that are then funded in out into the community where they know how to interrupt gun violence and they know their communities best have been really successful. And we have just stood up this office in 2020 and we haven't really put a lot of money there to really fund it. And I think that we need to change that. And the office has only asked for a million dollars in, in the budget. And we need to be as legislators, huge advocates to say, that's not enough. We saw inc huge increases in violence by guns in the last 18 months, and we can do better. And we need to act more urgently around that. So that's what I'm gonna be really pushing for. I also think that by restricting high capacity magazines, we can really prevent a lot of the really horrible, tragic shootings that we see in our communities. Uh, certainly the one that um, killed my friend Gabe, the, if the shooter had not had a high capacity magazine, not as many people would have been shot or killed. So it's also personal for me in that way. Um, but I have to tell you, um, when I feel really down in the movement and I have felt really sad the last week with this shooting in Michigan, it's really hard to keep perspective and keep um, marching on. And I always just think about Gabby, um, you know, her courage and grit and commitment to the movement keeps me going. And I know keeps all of you going too. So thanks. Thank you, Representative Barry. Um, and really appreciate your continued um, willingness to share your story um, because it really does help people understand the devastation of, of gun violence. So thank you. So I want to encourage everyone to please be putting questions in the chat. We are going to open for questions now, and I'm going to start uh, with one for Senator Frocht. And first, Senator, I just want to say to you, you know, one of the really um, encouraging and, uh, and un unanticipated um, outcomes that we've seen around gun violence during COVID is that our suicide rates have not gone up. They've not gone up country, in the whole nation. They've actually gone down in our state. Um, and I think all of us really anticipated that suicide would definitely be on the rise during COVID. And your leadership with extreme risk protection orders, um, I just want to commend you because I think that there we have a lot to untangle about why we've seen suicide rates go down, but I have to believe that extremist protection orders are a part of that. And anecdotally, we know from our, our friends around the state who are really working on implementing extreme risk protection orders that they have saved lives. So first, thank you for that. And now um, I would love to hear from you. You know, you've had the ability um, during your really um, amazing career to prime sponsor or carry nearly 60 bills uh, during your tenure in the Senate. I'd love for you just to talk a little bit about moving legislation through the process, 
um, that might help us in the future and specifically as it relates to gun uh, violence prevention legislation? What are things that we can be doing to make our movement more effective from your perspective? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Renee, and thank you for those those kind words. And I will tell you that um, I, I've, 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 I feel like I've had a good career <clears throat> and uh, hopefully this is not the end of my, my time in public service, but it's gonna be my time at the end as a lawmaker um, in, this, in the legislature. That said, of all the bills that I've passed, I've said this publicly on numerous occasions. I said this on a, a TV interview uh, just the other day. The extreme risk protection order bill, which we did not pass in the legislature, we tried really hard, but we didn't have the votes to get it through the state Senate. Um, and it was at that time thought to be new and novel. It's now much more commonly accepted around the country. We were the third or fourth state that was trying it. It came out of a tragedy um, that I um, uh, was aware of um, related to this horrible shooting down in Santa Barbara, this incident that we have Ms. Weiss on the, on the, um, on the call with us today. Her, her niece, as I recall, was, uh, was tragically murdered in that instance. And I said, there's gotta be something we can do. And that's when we started to draft that bill and we drafted it closely working with the Alliance. And though we didn't get it through, it laid the groundwork for the initiative. And so the first thing I would say in terms of passing any le legislation is, Whatever we can't get done because the votes aren't there, because the politics don't line up, don't get discouraged. Keep pushing. Keep making the point. I mean, the High Capacity Magazine, let's talk about that for a second. You know, um, once again, um, the, the, the reports are that the shooter in Michigan had a 15-round magazine, maybe had a couple of them. Now, let's ask the question. If, if they had limited it, let's say, to 10 in Michigan, would that have made a difference? Would one or two more? Would one or two more people be alive? We don't. We can't say that for sure. It's certainly possible. Is it worth it? Is it worth it for us to push that? Yes, it is. And we just got a great ruling out of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals on high capacity magazines. So there's a lot of questions right now with the many Trump appointees to the lower courts and the courts of appeals as to what's going to happen on gun. Uh, safety legislation in the states. We've got a, a very important Supreme Court case coming out. And I'm very worried because Justice Barrett, for all the talk about uh, reproductive rights and abortion, she is way out there on guns. And so is Ju Justice Kavanaugh, unfortunately. And this is a little known, I think, not as widely known in their confirmation hearing. So we have, we're really run some risks here. But the fact that the Ninth Circuit on a nine to four basis said that, yes, California can regulate high capacity magazines. There is a public policy basis. It is consistent with the Heller opinion uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and they overturned the lower court, the district court judge, who was a Trump appointee, who said, eh, doesn't matter that we've had this in place for 20 years. We're going we're gonna to throw that out. I mean, they've had shootings in California that could have been worse without those restrictions in place. So why do we make it legally possible? Anybody who needs to protect themselves can do so for, God, for goodness sake with a 10-round clip, for God's sakes. So to me, that seems very obvious. Um, so my, my message is let's keep pushing. Uh, don't get discouraged when things don't get, uh, don't get through. The, legis the, the composition of the legislature can change. Um, it, it goes back and forth. You know, it's gonna be a tough environment next year. I don't know what, who's gonna be leading what committees. It could be the other party in the, in the Senate. We hope that doesn't happen. They're not interested in gun violence. Uh, this is this is the defining issue between the two parties. Let's just be honest about it. Doesn't mean that everybody who votes Republican is against gun violence uh, reduction measures. They're certainly not. But in terms of the political leadership, it's pretty much a defining issue. So whether we're in control or not in control, we have people who want to lead on this. The key is the movement has to keep going and don't get discouraged when we have setbacks. That would be my main my main, uh, my main message, persistence will pay off eventually. Thanks so much for that, Senator Fracht. Um, and we hope that you will stay with us in the persistence, <laughs> whether you're in elected office or not. Um, I, I wanted to note that it looks like Pam Shell asked about um, the magazine size. And I think Senator Frocht just alluded to the, the 10 um, capacity magazine being what our goal will be in Washington state. And you'll see that in the legislation coming forward next year. Um, Representative Barry, I just wanted to say I really appreciated your op-ed in the Seattle Times. And it drew great attention um, to the spike in gun violence that you alluded to earlier in your opening remarks. 
And in that you called for several actions by the state legislature, including um, addressing the growing threat of so-called ghost guns. Uh, we've been hearing a lot from our partners who work, um, especially in the domestic violence um, protection order space that they are seeing a huge spike in ghost guns. So would love for you just to talk a little bit more about what you think um, we should and can do about ghost guns and talk to any legislation that you're considering for this year. That was a great softball question, Renee. I love that because it's my bill. Um, so yes, I'm very excited. So, so very excited this year to be introducing a bill that would restrict access to ghost guns or untraceable DIY firearms. And a few years ago, you may recall that there was a bill to prohibit the 3D printing of ghost guns, untraceable guns. We've seen now this uptick in folks who go online and buy different parts on the internet, have them mailed to their home, and then assemble them at their home. They have no serial numbers. And our greatest concern with that is that we're seeing these being highly trafficked in the, the underground gun market in criminal activity. And in fact, um, really tragically, just a few days ago, I read an article in the Washington Post that there was a, a teenage boy who was who was buying these parts online, assembling them and selling them to criminals and actually was confronted during one of his sales in a violent way by one of the criminals. He pulled out another gun to shoot the person, end up shooting and killing his sister who was there with him. I mean, this is a really, really tragic situation. And the fact that these guns have no serial numbers, they're completely untraceable. So, you know, the hobbyists, you know, this, this argument that it's hobbyists who are assembling these, these fun guns that they collect. Well, I don't understand why they don't have serial numbers on them. So they're, they're traceable. I mean, that's just unacceptable to me. Um, and there was a wonderful profile in the New York Times just a couple of year, weeks ago that it was just really stunning to see because it really outlines the prevalence of these guns law enforcement seeing in the market and how we're just not, the laws have not caught up to what they're doing. Um, President Biden is working on some federal rulemaking around ghost guns. We've still gotten um, nods from our national partners at Giffords in every town um, and grandmothers that we should pursue our law here in Washington State, even though they're making great progress at the federal level. And we're writing it airtight, knowing there's going to be many, many um, challenges in the courts on this bill. So I have to tell you, we've been writing this law since June. We still are not done tinkering with it because we just want to get it perfect because we know, you know that what the battle is going to be like for us. Um, so I'm really proud to work on this bill this year. I've learned a lot about it and um, it'll be my first go, I think, of a, real, of a real fight here of a big bill. So I'm pretty excited about that. I also have the lost or stolen bill, the bill saying that if your firearm is lost or stolen within five days, you have to report that to local law enforcement. I think that's also a really important piece of legislation. I think you know we have to be strategic about what are we gonna push this year. Um, and so I'll be looking to advocates to help us um, navigate that. Cause as you know, whenever we do a gun bill, um, it's quite the fight on the floor. And I learned that last year when we did the bill around um, um, the, the, the Patty Cooter's bill on uh, protesting and, and open carry. I learned it was a very interesting experience for me as a, as a new legislator to watch that scene. And I got right in the middle of it. You know, I did and told my story, which was interesting. So anyway, um, looking forward to pushing that bill this year and learning more about, but we I've been in the battle for many years. I know what it's gonna be like. So I've got my armor on, I'm ready, I'm ready for it. <laughs> Wonderful, well, we really appreciate that and look forward to, um, to helping in that fight. Representative Berg, I want to um, turn just a little bit uh, to talk about a, an issue that's very intersectional with gun violence, and that is police accountability. I think our movement has grown a lot in the past number of years to really identify uh, police violence as part of the gun violence um, problem. And I know you were instrumental in helping pass a number of police accountability bills next last year. Um, and you know, we've heard a lot in the public discourse um, with very loud feedback from a number of police organizations um, about challenges with those laws, some of which I think is hyperbole, some of which might be accurate. 
uh, but would just love to hear from you about what you see happening during the upcoming session in regards to police accountability um, and any response you have to some of the criticisms that have been uh, that have been made. Yeah, well, thank you for that question, Renee. And I think it's really important to recognize the intersection there between gun violence and policing and police accountability. And really what we're talking about at the heart of all of it, and I think Senator Frock touched on it, was community and how do we keep our communities safe? And does it take someone with a gun um, and a badge to, to present that um, element of safety and just really unpacking it from there. And it's, it's been difficult conversations. I will say the package of police reforms that we passed in our last historic session were well um, talked about in the community with law enforcement, with law enforcement organizations. Um, there were a lot of amendments. We really tried hard to get it right. Was it perfect? Absolutely not. Do we have to do some very um, basic fixes for clarification? and so folks know exactly what our intent was and what we meant. Um, but that said, we got the essence of safety right. And I think right now we're at a point of clarifying with communities um, about what it means to be kept safe. I think a lot of uh, police organizations, I shouldn't say a lot, some police organizations have misinterpreted our intent. Um, and have pulled back from doing things as basic as securing uh, the scene for their fellow firefighters. And that of course was not the intent. Um, the intent was really to help communities where they were and to provide alternatives like de-escalation to keep communities safe. And I think as we talk about um, gun reform and gun law reform, it's really important to, to understand we're not talking about being less safe. And I think when we start conflating the two with I have to have a gun to feel safe or, or someone has to have a firearm to keep someone or something safe, that's when we get into real problems. So um, I, I think as we move towards this next session again we're going to do some real basic fixes to get make sure it's clear but we are going to still keep communities safe and it does not take a gun to do that um, and I think that's really important because as we delve deeper into cultural considerations and, and community safety we've got to get out of kind of what I call the robocop mentality um, of what it looks like to have a community safe. And, and just to let you know that I know of which I speak, I was born on the south side of Chicago and we still have a tremendous problem with guns in my community, the community I grew up in, um, the high school I went to, and quite frankly, every street corner in my um, neighborhood at home in Chicago has a, a very large police presence and it's no more safe. It is still considered one of the most dangerous communities in our great country and I'm hoping one day that will change but I can tell you it won't having more guns in the street that's not what does it thank you for that really thoughtful response and thank you for your leadership um, in this area I think it's really important and we look forward to continuing to work with you on it we have a question uh, for Senator Frocht from Margie uh, Margie asked if you could talk a little bit more about the um, softer interventions and community-based um, work that you spoke of in your um, in your opening remarks, Senator. Well, thank you um, for the question, Margie. Um, I think that uh, I guess what I'm getting at, and first of all, I I would I would actually uh, defer to Represent Berg. I think she's got her finger right on the pulse of kind of the types of interventions that we need to. Um, we need to be supporting. In my mind, it's mostly about making affirmative, uh, taking affirmative steps, particularly on the funding side, um, because those organizations need, need support. They need formalized support. They need to be able to hire and have staff that are full-time that are working on these issues, not just people who want to do good in their communities and see what's happening and know that um, that uh, you know there are changes that can be made but if we can uh, formalize our process and I think the Office of Gun Violence Prevention um, I mean there was so much consternation about that uh, that measure back uh, a couple of years ago when we passed it and for what I don't under I never understood what was <laughs> we, what it wasn't about taking I mean it really I didn't see it about taking somebody's uh, firearms away it was really about I think looking at best practices and best evidence to try to make our communities safer and I think uh, we could use that that in instrument 
to help push out money to the right kinds of organizations. That would be my my instinct. And I think that I think they need that support. So they need formalized support from the state, both local and and state. Perhaps there's some grant opportunities and things like that that we can do. I'm guessing that's kind of what part of that uh, part of their uh, uh, charge will be. Thanks. For if that. I may, can I jump yeah. in, Renee? Yeah, please. We'll do what David said. You know, if we spend and invested in these community-based solutions that de-escalate violence and right. and help, um, you know, de-escalate um, the use of guns in everyday life in communities, and we spend the same amount of money on that that we do on state law enforcement or local law enforcement, that would be incredibly impactful. And at $15 million is just a start. We need to be investing so much more every year in these kinds of programs, study them, and really invest in them so that they can be successful because we know the model works. I think that's that's just the key here. And I, same with the mental health and the navigators and the behavioral health that April put in the chat. We need to even that funding playing field with just not just the law enforcement part of it, but the other de-escalation parts of it too. And people who are lived, you know, live in the communities and know the people living there. That is huge, I think. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I also appreciate, I think we get in this um, sense of thinking about it with a scarcity model that we either have to support law enforcement or support community-based solutions. And in my mind, that's just not true. Um, so I, I appreciate that. You, you know, uh, it's interesting, if I could just add one more comment, Renee, real quick. I think, I think um, Rep. Barry, Rep. Berg, they've most, both made great points on this. The public, the vast majority of the public, everybody instinctively know anybody who's sort of, except if you're completely on the fringe and fetishize our gun culture in this country, the vast majority of people, whether they own guns or have no experience with guns, people understand we have a problem in this country. It is a unique problem among all of the other countries of our, of our development, if you will. And I think there is a real appetite. There is no political downside for supporting these kinds of efforts that, 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 uh, that Liz is talking about. And I think, frankly, we've talked about how to get people through. We need to communicate that to even the people who are, who are more, more traditional Second Amendment supporters, because there are some of those people, not everybody, but some of them will understand that even while they support uh, strongly uh, uh, their, their view of what the Second Amendment should say, they also don't want people to be killed needlessly and without, um, without uh, trying to make interventions. So I hope that maybe we can create some kind of consensus around that effort. Representative Berg, I want to make sure you have an opportunity to weigh in on this as well. Yeah, no, thank you. I kind of I've just been kind of yesing and amening in the background, <laughs> my colleagues speaking, because all of this is so, so important. Um, but I think that the bottom line is that, you know, policy really is um, is a normalizing factor, right? So when we when we look at behavior and we look at what we feel like is normal behavior, a lot of times you can find the root of that in policy. And I say that because right now our fiscal policy around what we fund and where we put our dollars is normalizing behavior that is not right for community. And so we don't need more guns and more you know military <laughs> presence in communities. We do need that softer approach, but we have to follow that with our policy making and our, specifically our fiscal policy making. And I think communities, um, you know, we have to really be careful about those intersections because we're talking about um, criminal justice reform measures that need to be implemented. We're talking about educational reform measures that need to be implemented. We're talking about basic poverty initiatives, things, everything from housing to food security to access to transportation. Those all play a role into why people make certain decisions about either their safety or how they feel like they need to put and I'll just say it, food on the table. Um, if we've, you know, made options this narrow in terms of communities that are marginalized and feeling as though there is no hope, bad choices will be made. Um, and, and I'll just be frank, that's regardless of race or culture or, or gender. That's just a fact of marginalization and poverty in our country and in our state specifically. So, so we just have to get back to that community policy making, normalizing behavior through policy that we want to see enacted. Thank you for that very well said. Um, 
I have a question here from Margo, uh, and I'm just going to open this to any one of you. Um, please outline the financial resources that are going to our colleges and universities right now to increase their openings for staff. We need to do the mental health, behavioral health work in place or with police officers and place up or with police officers. I don't know who's so I can answer that. I can okay, kind of jump in. I can, yeah, I, I'll it's talk. Great. So, so what we had last session was a historic response from our um, Supreme Court around uh, Blake, and it was called the Blake decision. And as a result of that decision, not to get too wonky in the policy, we're having a lot of decision packages. We had a lot of decision packages last um, last legislative session, but we'll have more to come that deal specifically with increasing access to training and also opening more slots for behavioral health. Um, specialists, and that's to do a, a number of things, everything that you see of keeping communities safer, but also dealing with substance use disorder. And that's a really big underlying factor in a lot of the conversations we're having. So when I look to what we're doing as kind of uh, point two, two point oh to our answer to Blake, a lot of those supports and funding for those supports are going to be found in that bill. I don't want to use the O word, which is omnibus, because we know that's a bad word in a short session. Um, but there is kind of a package of bills that are going to come together to hopefully um, answer fiscally some of these questions. Thank you for that. And you know, this is an area where we are happy to be turning on our great um, advocacy power from across the state to be um, in support of those things as well, because they clearly are intersectional um, with gun violence. So thank you for your leadership on that. Um, I'm gonna put, send this question to Senator Frocht because I know that you have um, been a real champion for funding of research with the University of Washington. Um, when we look at um, all kinds of programming, um, but it's, this question I think is specifically about community violence intervention programming, uh, data collection is really important and partnerships with um, higher ed resources to make sure that we're really understanding what is working about programming so that it can be replicated in other areas is also really important. So could you talk just a little bit about your efforts in supporting uh, research and where you think there are additional opportunities for that? Well, thank you, Renee. Thank you for the question to Cheryl, um, who I know well has been a great champion on all these issues. Um, so we, we've provided some support directly to the University of Washington um, Office of I believe it's injury injury prevention. I can't remember all of the, the specific name of it, but basically they deal with uh, all injury prevention with this focus on gun violence injuries. Uh, and they've done some really important work to, for example, um, I believe they were surveying initially the, uh, the ERPO statute that was with some uh, data that they were collecting early on about how it was being utilized and what the effects were and really looking uh, at it at a, uh, at a uh, deeper level. Um, so I think those kinds of partnerships with uh, with uh, researchers at various institutions could be really helpful. I don't. I think we can certainly support, and we should support um, our local uh, universities. But I don't think we should necessarily be limited if there are ways that we can partner with other groups. I think, of, for example, the Johns Hopkins Center for Viol Gun Violence Prevention. Uh, they've done some seminal work, um, and uh, uh, that would be an area. That would be you know other schools of public health where. Uh, people are really looking at gun violence as a public health measure. We've got some great uh, leaders academically in uh, Washington State on that on this issue, but there are others as well that we could be working with. So uh, how that would really play out, I haven't really given it as much thought perhaps as I should, but it's something that we should definitely explore. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Senator Frocht. And thank you. Oh, I see Margie just put this in the chat. I was going to say um, also just a huge shout out of gratitude towards the grandmothers because I know that you have really prioritized investment in, uh, in gun violence prevention research. And we're seeing the fruits of that um, as, we, as we speak. So thank you so much for your leadership in that area. So we have about five minutes left um, before I'm going to turn the program over uh, to Susan uh, to close us out. But I um, would just love to hear from each of you. I think, you know, we all bring such personal stories to the work that we do and the things that we volunteer with and the um, and sort of what motivates us as, as humans. 
And I would just love to hear from each of you, um, what, what makes you the most excited and passionate about representing the various districts that you do and about the work that you do as elected officials? And let's start with Representative Barry. Oh, I love that. Um, well, it's a new honor and privilege for me because I just got elected a year ago. I can't even believe it's been a year. <laughs> and we've been legislating on Zoom, which is so strange. I'd so much rather be with you all in person. But um, I am so inspired to serve my community and I think give people a voice who don't always have a seat at the table. I think that's really what inspires me every day. And, um, you know, I think having different lived experiences is what makes our legislature so interesting and so um, fruitful and so um, diverse. And I think, you know, the, 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 the lens I bring with my personal story of tragic gun violence, it really makes me a champion and makes this issue personal for me and, and makes it something that I'm going to fight every single day to, to move the needle on. And having you all here is so inspiring. Thank you for your work. The grassroots movement around interrupting gun violence in our communities is absolutely breathtaking. I, I haven't seen anything like it before. And having you all, when I when I feels lonely and we're out there battling, knowing you all are standing right behind me gives me so much strength. So thank you so much for everything you do. Please reach out if there's anything I can do, if you've got a good idea, if I can be a champion for you. And um, together we'll change the world. Thanks so much, Barry. Uh, Representative Berg. Yeah, thank you for that ending question. I do like the softball ones, but I tell you, um, serving has been just my greatest honor and pleasure. And like Brett Barry, this is my first term. And so being able to come in with such a strong and passionate um, first term class has been amazing. But one of the reasons that I'm, I'm in this space and doing this work is really for students. Um, I come with an educational background. I've got six kiddos myself. Um, we've seen it all. My oldest is 27, my youngest is 15. Um, and in addition, to that, I lost my first husband to suicide. So that is a lot of my informed decision comes out of tragedy as well. And so when I'm passionate in doing the work, I do it with that lens of not just equity, but also a lens towards marginalization and, and why communities make decisions they do and how can we help those communities. Um, the other piece that I bring to it is just a real specific um, set of moral values, if you will, as it relates to poverty, because I just believe poverty is a policy choice that we have to stop making. And that intersection of poverty will help us in everything else, um, including eliminating gun violence and passing common sense gun laws. So I will just end it with, you know, I'm in the 44th, I'm in Snohomish County, I am what's considered a swing district, but I will always advocate for what's right. And I, um, and I just, I really love the fact that I can represent folks who allow me to be an authentic leader and to take um, really just big steps in, on big issues like this that maybe in the past swing district folks haven't been able to do. Thank you so much for that. And Senator Frucht. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for monitoring this, Renee. Um, I will just say that uh, I just want to say one quick thing and then I'll, I'll address your question. Um, the ERPO statute um, I don't know if I made this clear, but I wanted to just say this because so many of you were behind it. Um, I didn't, that bill didn't pass the legislature, as I mentioned, but to me, of, of the things that I've tried to do in my 12 years, that was the most important bill of all. Because I know for a fact, I know for a, a moral certainty that it has saved lives. We don't know exactly how many lives it saved. But the fact that the public recognized, even though the led the politicians didn't, that it would save lives and passed it in such overwhelming num numbers. I mean, I can think of very famous people in our, in our community who we love and revere, including sports figures, who are maybe alive today and maybe uh, because of the law that we put in place. And so um, don't ever think that this stuff doesn't make a difference because it can, it really, and it will. And I would say just secondly, I'm really privileged to represent a district where the positions on, gun, on guns that I've been able to take very much reflects the will of our constituency. Uh, my district represent various districts. These are, 
these are pretty popular positions, but they're the right ones. And I feel like I reflect that in my, in my policy making. I will say to all of you who maybe don't follow the ins and outs of the legislature, Representative Berg is an incredibly brave political figure. Uh, and I'm not, and I don't mean that in a, in a, in a, in a trite way, she's, she's, she's not doing this to, to show her, you know, how brave she is, but the fact that she's stepping out on this issue in a district where I can tell you the former Senator from this district would not, would not vote in favor of these issues in favor of gun violence prevention. He would occasionally vote for some of them, but not most of them on the grounds that his constituency wouldn't support it. So we need to support Representative Berg and people like her who are speaking truth, who are speaking common sense and are communicating a vision to lead and not just be reflective of what they believe public opinion is, but to lead public opinion. So please support her uh, and I will be supporting her. It's been a pleasure to be on with you and uh, with Representative Berg today. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And before I pass it back to uh, Susan, I just want to say thank you to each of you from the bottom of my heart for the work that you do. Um, and I also want to um, circle back to say back to Margie's opening and very kind remarks and in introducing me. Yes, our state is leading in state-based change, and yes, the Alliance is part of that, but the grandmothers are also a huge part of that. And so please know that everything that, um, that you all do matters and that we're in this together and our state would not be leading like we are without each of you. So thank you so much. And Susan, I'll pass it over to you. Hi, I'm Susan Simon, co-chair of Grandmothers. And um, I just, after, this has been an amazing program. Um, and I have to thank, in addition to the others I will thank, I have to thank Patty Otley and Jennifer Dolan Wallman um, and their committee, the legislative committee, and I'm sure the program committee for organizing this program. Um, it's, it's been amazing to listen to. Um, and on behalf of grandmothers, I wanna thank Renee for being a terrific moderator as always. And I want to thank Senator Frocht and Repre representatives Barry and Berg for being a part of our program. Uh, we know your time is valuable and we are most appreciative of the time you have spent with us today. Uh, and last but not least, we want to thank the Alliance staff for your technical and additional support. Uh, we are very grateful for our partnership with the Alliance. Um, we want to encourage each of you today for joining us and to advocate for gun safety issues in the coming session. While the session will be partly virtual and partly in person, all committee hearings will be virtual. This gives us the opportunity to share our support of gun safety measures from wherever we are all over the state. Since we can't be a sea of orange in the hearing rooms, we can register individual support of our priority bills in advance, and we can turn, tune in to TVW, which will cover all hearings most in real time. Directions on how to do this will be provided in constant contact emails to you as hearing agendas become available. General directions will also be available on our website under advocacy. Um, and also be sure to watch for news about Grandmother's Virtual Lobby Week, uh, which will probably be the last week in January. We hope you will all join us then, please do. Um, I also wanna uh, draw your attention to our annual membership drive, which is underway right now. You who are members received an, uh, um, received an electronic email. If you're not a member, we certainly hope you will join Grandmothers. Our work depends upon member dues and contributions. We urge you to continue to support our efforts and strategies for reducing gun violence and to invite family and friends to join us. We show up 
we stand up, we speak up, only with your support. In closing, I want to thank you all for joining us today. And again, our speakers and Renee, uh, thank you so much. Um, we wish you all happy and healthy holidays, and we look forward to seeing you in the new year. Bye.